who knows what tomorrow brings. Better make the most of today and finish that book because Richard and Judy have another great set of authors for you to enjoy on their book club, exclusive to WH Smith. Well, we have an award winner for you on this edition of the podcast as we join Robert Harris in a historical reenactment. Yes, yet again. It's 1895 and the public trial of a suspected spy sets in action a fascinating chain of events. Robert Harris, an officer and a spy. Now, there have been many infamous uh, miscarriages of justice uh, down the centuries and probably one of the most famous in the last hundred or so years or more was the Dreyfus Affair. You picked big themes, Robert. I mean, in The Ghost, you picked basically what might have happened post-Iraq war to Tony Blair in a slightly different version of reality. I would be frightened of doing that. I would be frightened of picking such big subjects um, and playing with them, really, um, as a novelist. And The Dreyfus Affair is, as I said in the, that, those opening remarks, is a huge story in, in, in French history. Why do you pick these big themes? Uh, I suppose because I was a political journalist, as you say, and uh, that's my kind of material, really. I've never had a great interest in writing about my adolescence and my, <laughs> my traumas. Um, I'm quite interested in the world and how it ticks and telling stories about mm -hmm. it, and I suppose that leads me inevitably into quite big political subjects because that's, that's my natural territory. And why did you think that a true life story about a true life miscarriage of justice, which was eventually remedied, as we all know, why did you think that that would lend itself to a novel when it's been written about factually so many times and in so many different ways and, and filmed and everything? Well, it started off, oddly enough, as not being my idea, but Roman Polanski, who directed the movie of The Ghost, he wanted to make a film about the Dreyfus Affair, and uh, I approached it with a heavy heart, to be honest, because <laughs> it goes on for 12 years and there's a cast of hundreds, yeah. and I wondered whether people in the 21st century would be interested in this 19th century scandal. But then as I started to read around it, I came across this real dark kind of espionage, cover-up, political cover-up story at the heart of it. I thought... This is a great story. And I said to him, look, I'd sooner do this as a novel, to be honest, and mm -hmm. rather than a movie. Uh, so I came upon it that way, read about it, and I became obsessed with this the central figure, uh, Colonel Picard, right. who is sort of the world's first great whistleblower, mm. who uh, realised that Dreyfus was innocent and destroyed his own career by trying to expose what had happened to him. Well, can you, can, you, can mm. you tell us the, the Dreyfus story for, for those people who don't know anything about it? Yeah, uh, Alfred Dreyfus, Captain Alfred Dreyfus, was a French army officer, Jewish, uh, in the 1890s, uh, who was arrested and tried for treason, uh, was found guilty in a secret court-martial and was sent to Devil's Island for life. Um, he was not allowed to speak to anyone, and they put him on this really tiny rock, which is sort of like 600 yards by 100 yards mm -hmm. off the coast of South America. And uh, it became a huge cause célèbre in France, uh, and uh, really sp split French society completely. And eventually he was exonerated, but it took 12 years. Mm. And my novel is, is written from the point of view who made the Dreyf of the person who made the Dreyfus Affair happen, which was the head of the secret intelligence service mm. in France, yeah. who realised they'd got the wrong man. Right. Well, why was he framed? Why, why did they do that? Well, I think to begin with, they probably thought he genuinely was guilty. Of selling secrets to the Germans. Yes, yeah. yes. The, the, the crime was passing five or six secret documents to the Germans. The mm. French had a, a brilliant secret agent in the German embassy, <laughs> the greatest secret agent in Europe. She was the cleaning lady mm -hmm. of the German military attaché, and she used to take his waste paper basket, and instead of burning it, uh, she used to take it all to French intelligence, mm. who would then glue all the documents back together <laughs> yeah. that he'd torn up. And they realised that there was a traitor handing documents to the Germans, and they wrongly assumed that it was this man Dreyfus, because he was Jewish, I think. That sure. he, he was the only Jewish officer in the French general staff. He spoke with a slight German accent. They thought he was dodgy. They picked him up. He didn't confess. Uh, and in the end, he ended up pretty well framed. Right. And they thought because he was Jewish, they could get away with it. Right. And my hero, even though he's quite anti-Semitic himself, Picard, beca Picard. Picard yeah. becomes head of the unit that had investigated Dreyfus. He, when he takes over the job, he assumes that he's, he was guilty. But then he gradually comes to realise there's another spy still operating mm. on mm. in France for the Germans. Mm -hmm. And he realises they must have picked up the wrong man. Right. So he goes to his superiors and says, you know, 
we've got the wrong man. And of course, they immediately closed down the investigation because they realised that if they try to bring Dreyfus back, the trail will then lead to them. So, so it's a very modern story, yes. actually, even though it's said in the 19th mm. century. So what, what motivated Picard then to carry on? I mean, so many career officers, uh, high-ranking officers such as him, with a whole career ahead of them, um, would have thought, well, OK, I'll just shut up then and get on with my life and, and, and my career. What motivated him to, to, to impale himself, really, on this investigation? As you say, it, it killed his career. Well, that is what's fascinating about Picard. He was highly intellectual. He spoke six languages, a very cultured man, and a real high flyer. He was the youngest colonel in the French army, mm. probably would have become head of, professional head of the French army. Mm. And when he came across this error, the thing about Picot was a rather modern scientific officer. He didn't like the, the hidebound reactionaries he was working for, and he just thought they were stupid, and he thought they were immoral. And for him, being a French army officer was a matter of honour. Uh, and mm. really, the novel is about this dilemma of conscience. Do you go with the rest of your comrades and your superiors mm. and take one for the team, as it were, <laughs> and sort of lie for the greater good of the army? Or do you follow your own conscience, mm. say, this is wrong, and in the end, if you force me to, I'll expose it. It's and that is, a mo that is quite a modern dilemma, actually. Yes, it is. But I also think that what is somewhat dated in the sense that we don't have these values as, as clearly in our grasp as perhaps he, he represents here in the book, that sense of honour. Sense of honour seems to me to be quite dissipated in, in modern times, would you agree? Yes, I think it is. I think the thing about Picard, it was an odd thing when we started to work on doing a movie about it. One felt that Picard, who begins the book quite anti-Semitic, he doesn't like Dreyfus, and uh, never does, in fact. <laughs> you think that in a conventional story, he would have the sort of, you know, Damascene conversion. Yes. You suddenly mm. think, oh, he's terrible the way he's being treated and <laughs> so on. Picard never had that. No. Picard... Uh, is it completely unsentimental about Dreyfus. He just thinks it's wrong. Yep. Uh, and that gave it the air of complexity, which made it, for me, an interesting story. It's not straightforward and conventional. And there is this... The book really builds up to this final scene between Dreyfus and Picard. It's a great scene. Which is, and it's, a it's true, scene. and it's from Dreyfus's own memoirs, and it's yeah. completely stilted. Yes. Two men who've both been through this extraordinary life changing experience because Picard was in prison for more than a year himself. Uh, and yet, in the end, they can hardly speak, speak to one another, yeah. but it's all about honour and duty. Mm -hmm. It's so different to the modern yes. X Factor kind of yes. culture of applauding someone if they hit the right note and everyone's <laughs> weeping. You know? I, thought it, I have to say, I thought that you wrote that scene beautifully. It really did capture it. was so real, as you say, it's based on, on, on his own, his own uh, diaries, his own writings. But it was a very, very real. And again, that was quite a dated encounter. I can't imagine two men who'd been through that today speaking to each other like that. I don't know. What happened to Picard in the end, in his real life? Did he have Picard, a happy ending? Uh, Picard... Uh, well, I won't give away the end of the no. book. No, 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 I don't want but, you to But Picard... Uh, um, Picard is a man who's vanished in history, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book. You know, nobody's ever heard of him now. Mm. At the time, he was as famous as sort of Edward Snowden or any other whistleblower. Mm. Mm. But uh, he never married, he had mistresses, he had no children. Um, he wasn't liked by the Jewish community because he was anti-Semitic. He was loathed by the French army and establishment because he'd been a whistleblower. Uh, he ended up, he was commander of the German arm, uh, French army corps in Amiens in ni the beginning of 1914. Mm -hmm. And six months before the outbreak of the First World War, he, was, he had a riding accident uh, and died a couple of days later. Mm -hmm. but, but for that, he would have been in command of the French army when the Germans attacked wow. in 1914. So, mm. you know, who knows what would have happened. We might have thought, remembered him for a different reason. What we haven't touched on here is the, the vividness of your writing about that period and what Paris was like um, in, the, in the 1890s. And you write about these terrible periods in the summer, usually when the first warm weather arrived, because the sewage system in Paris was hopeless. The stench... What's new? What's new? <laughs> <laughs> but the stench that hung over the city, I mean, it was seriously bad. Um, you know, people wouldn't, wouldn't go out because it was so bad, and it would hang around for days. Yeah, this is one of the pleasures of doing this sort of work, in that I actually I went back and looked through all the newspapers of the period, and I got mm. hold of the Times, and the, and, the, and the week that Picard took over the Secret Intelligence Service, which was about five months after Dreyfus had been sent to Devil's Island, 
uh, coincided with what was called the Great Stink, uh, <laughs> where you know it's very hard to go out of doors, and people wore had to wear masks and cover their noses because the whole of France, the uh, whole of Paris, reeked of excrement, to put yeah. it bluntly. And of course, for a novelist, this is a wonderful kind of natural <laughs> metaphor Absolutely. that they're covering up this immense wrongdoing, <laughs> and the whole place stinks uh, when he goes in to take over the job. Yeah. And it's also the wonderful counterpoint. This was the La Belle Epoque, you know. This was the, yes. the, the golden. Age, and yet well you've, you've got all the city of light you've got mm -hmm. you know the, the day that Dreyfus was condemned after this fixed trial to go to De to be sentenced to life imprisonment was the day that Debussy's La Prémédie d'un Faune was premiered that oh, very evening gosh. an hour after Dreyfus was gosh. sentenced which is said to be the birth of modern music mm -hmm. you know uh, so you've got this extraordinary you know, kind of this golden belle epoque on top and then underneath it the corruption, the anti-Semitism, uh, the cover-up. Yes. Uh, will it be a film? <laughs> will Polanski make it into a film? Uh, uh, supposedly. I've learned over long experience uh, not to <laughs> count on these things too much, but supposedly, yes, the script is done and he's mm. going to start uh, shooting in January. This is the very special Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. And if you're in the mood for more, check out the bonus content just for you at richardandjudy.whsmith.co.uk. What I like about Robert Harris in his writing is that he takes something that actually happened and then he spins a kind of what if out of it, mm. like in his book The Ghost, mm -hmm. uh, which is essentially about Tony Blair and the war in Iraq and, and what might have happened to Tony Blair had reality just bent a little bit in another direction mm. after the war and after Blair had stood down as, as Prime Minister. And that was a fascinating book. And he's kind of done the same here. He's taken this infamous uh, uh, true event in, in French history, the Dreyfus Affair, this persecution of, uh, of a Jewish and, and a very senior army officer, uh, his incarceration for years in, in prison, and then his eventual redemption and uh, his, his uh, acceptance back into, into mainstream society. And it was a terrible, terrible miscarriage of justice. And anyone who's ever read, read it, their blood boils mm. with, with rage for what happened to this guy, and largely because he was Jewish. But he puts the classic Harris spin on it. Mm. Um, and I wouldn't dare to do that. It's a very courageous thing for a writer to do, to actually take something which a lot of people know happened or live with as, as part of their daily reality uh, but just twists it, mm. puts a different, a different angle on it. Dreyfus was obviously framed. He was accused of spying. Totally framed, yeah. Uh, he was a accused of leaking uh, French military secrets yep. to the German embassy in Paris. Yep. Um, and he always insisted he was completely innocent. And indeed, it's now become come to be accepted that indeed he was completely innocent. Um, but nevertheless, he was accused and he was humiliated and he was sent to Devil's Island, wasn't he? Yes. Um, in total isolation, he had guards there to keep him there. This uninhabited to speak. island. They couldn't talk to him. Couldn't talk to him. The poor guy nearly lost his mind. Yep. And he was only saved by the central character in uh, Georges Picard. Georges Picard, George Picard, who is a very, very well-regarded, uh, high-standing uh, member of the Parisian French, military. French High Command. French yeah. High Command. Yeah. yeah. And absolutely, and and he initially accepts that Dreyfus is completely guilty and, and, and detests him and uh, uh, is contemptuous of him as a traitor, and then doubts start to emerge. He starts to hear things, he picks up vibrations, he gets strange reports, and he begins to think that maybe there has been this terrible miscarriage of justice. But of course, the French establishment don't want to know. I mean, mm. they're not interested in that. As far as they're concerned, Dreyfus is as good as dead. Uh, but yes, you're right, he ultimately, without giving anything away, um, he saves the day. And he's a wonderful character. And I like, I like the way that in his books, he always, Robert Harris, when he's using true historical events, he always gets inside the morality and, yes, uh, and, and, and the, the actual personalities of the people involved. Mm. And he brings the morality very much to the fore. He doesn't just, um, he doesn't just focus on the actual unfolding of events no. and imprisonment and accusations and all the rest of it. He, you really get to know the characters, and you get to either like them or dislike them intensely, which yes. is, of course, what happened in The Ghost. You know, a lot of people, the way The Ghost ended, um, mm. which is with the Tony Blair figure mm. basically being blown up, um, a lot of people were delighted by that. A lot of people, including Tony Blair 
himself, I believe, <laughs> were really, really fed up. Mm. Uh, he really gets into these people and he examines their actions in a context of morality. He also, when he's writing about the more distant past, as he is in this book, he, he brings back a sense of, of the time and the period very well. For example, uh, we're in Paris for much of the time in the late 1890s and it's vivid and, um, and, and he writes it vividly. And it may have been the, the golden era of, uh, of La Belle Epoque, but in Paris, in summer, in those days, for all the frills and the cafe culture and the elegance, it stank like a sewer. Mm. And there were days on end when people really couldn't go outside mm. and walked around with no nosegays under their noses because the stench of mm. the sewers. Anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a fabulous, absorbing and thrilling piece of writing. Um, well, I guess you just have to say, Robert Harris, you've done it again. The problem with writing novels that are historically accurate is that the history doesn't always arrange itself in what is natural for a story. Therefore, you have to edit, you have to simplify, um, you have to try and um, take um, the best of what happened in the past and turn it into a narrative. And oddly enough, I think that that is as hard, if not harder, uh, than making the story completely up from scratch. The great thing about the Dreyfus Affair is that it happened in Paris in the 1890s, which is one of the most extraordinary times uh, in the history of the world, I think, in terms of the culture, the excitement of that time, what was going on in Paris. And so what I wanted to try to do was to take all that was most interesting and exciting of that period and weave it into the novel. And to that extent, writing historical fiction does give you this uh, immense gift of being able to tap into eras more interesting than your own and everything the daily life the restaurants where you go traveling um you know you can try and weave that into the story and uh, that's what i try to do uh, to bring alive uh, the world as it was its smells and its feels and what it was you know just like to be alive at that time this novel is rather odd in that it it started life as an idea for a movie with Roman Polanski, which was then, um, I said, and with his agreement, that I prefer to do it as a novel first. And although I think the novel is intrinsically quite filmic because there are big set-piece scenes in it, nevertheless, the novel is 150,000 words long, and it's very detailed, you know, much more detailed than, than the film could ever possibly hope to be. And so, uh, for me, uh, the dictates of a novel are predominant. And in this particular case, the essence of the Dreyfus affair is the minutiae of a spy story, uh, uh, which you can get into with much more complexity than you can in a movie, which is why I really wanted to write this as a novel in the first place. Now, we're taking a vivid tour of First World War trench warfare next time, courtesy of Helen Dunmore. It was a war which completely transformed our society it transformed hundreds of thousands, millions of lives, and we are the products of that war. And I wanted to look at the aftershocks as they are shown through young men and young women who've come of age during that war. The writing in The Lie is so vivid, you can almost smell the stench of the battlefield. So come back to hear more on the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. If physically turning pages is a thing of the past for you, we have some great ebook offers for your Kobo. Have a look at the website.